I was so caught up in worship, I forgot. It was my turn. <laughs> Welcome. Um, it's funny, Todd Holton said, hey, if you want to come around at 3.30 a.m. on Saturday to see us off, and I was looking at um, how much we struggle sometimes to get here at 10.30, because it looks a lot different um, now, a few minutes later, than it did at like 10.27. It's good to see your faces this morning. I'm so glad that we get to worship together. And whenever we gather and worship, you know, all the parts of this morning are part of our worship, of meeting with God as his people. And one of those things that we always do is pray over the offering. And this week I was talking with Bonnie Filson, our bookkeeper, and I said, Bonnie, how much did we pay last year just to keep the lights on, the heat on, and the water running? And the answer is just above $89,000. That is because of your tithes to this church. And so it's not just for us who get to come in here in this place and be built up and equipped to go out, but also in this last week, I know the homeschool group was here. I know that we have a free service that is working here. It's not ours, but it's for tax prep for people who can't afford to hire someone. That's happening in our building. I also know that we hosted the Red Cross Blood Drive this week. I also know that plenty of pickleball was played here this week, right? Uh, there's all these things. There were hundreds of college students here this week in this space. So all of this is because of your faithful tithes to this place. And so again today, we come before the Lord. I'm going to pray over our tithes and offerings this morning and pray for our time in the Word. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, God, um, that you have put the Arbor Church here in this place, and that, Lord, you have sustained it for more than 160 years. God, what an amazing thing. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to do great things through the ministry, through the people of this body. Lord, as we bring our tithes, as we return to you what you have given to us, Lord, we ask that you would make much of those things, that they would be used not only for us to become rooted in Jesus and grow and bring life where we go, but that many would come to know the life found in Christ, that death can truly be arrested through faith in Jesus. What amazing truth. This morning, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak. We pray, Holy Spirit, that right now in this moment, you would quiet our thoughts, quiet our hearts to be connected with you today. Be our teacher. Be our strength. Most of all, Lord, we pray that your voice speaking over us reminds us of who we are because of who you are. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. So a couple weeks ago when I started this series, Chris Newhouse, who's been a longtime member of this church, he sent me a story about the couple that mentored Chris and Kathy when they were new Christians. Their name are, names are Bob and Carolyn, and Bob and Carolyn met while doing a church service project, and Bob was intrigued by her, so he sent her a note afterwards. And at the end of the note, he put a scripture reference, 3 John 5, which says something about um, you are doing well in your faithful service to strangers. But when Carolyn read the note, she was kind of excited and went to the wrong reference. She went to 2 John 5, where it says, I ask that we love one another. <laughs> so the next time they saw each other at church, she seemed to be very friendly to him, and it took some time for them to realize that she had actually misread the reference that he gave her out of the letters from John. And I think about that, and I think, I'm sure Carolyn, this woman, who I, I will also add that 60 years later, this couple is married and doing ministry together, uh, Carolyn was much more drawn by this invitation to relationship than she would have been by the work that she was doing that he was praising in the first place. We were created with this desire to be loved and to love people. I mean, this is what we were created for. God didn't need us, right? There's, God is perfect and complete. There is perfect love within Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so creating humans and this good earth that we have to dwell in, this was out of an overflow of the love of God, not because he needed us to do something for him. 
And so this reality that we were created for loving relationship with God and one another, when sin enters, this desire that we were created with becomes twisted. It was broken, right? And this is how, as C.S. Lewis talks about, we have these disordered loves that we go after, these things that become idols in our lives, when really, even though many of us don't even know it, what we're looking for is to be truly, fully known and loved and to be able to love others out of that overflow. And that's what John wants these people to know. We've been talking about how John, as a pastor to these groups of churches, he wanted to do two things. He wanted to bring correction, but he also wanted to bring encouragement. And so here's John constantly in this balance of teaching in a way that brings correction, but he's always wanting to encourage them. Last week, we looked at how they know Jesus. We saw the phrase, you know him, repeated over and over again. Today, we're going to focus on the fact that he wants us to know who we are in him. So at the end of 1 John chapter 2, we read this statement from John where he said, now, dear children, continue in him. This is that remain, abide, dwell in him. Like, don't just visit once in a while, but actually live your life in awareness that you are in relationship with him and he is in you by the Holy Spirit, right? Remain in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does, right, does what is right has been born of him. And he uses this phrase, born of him. We see it a few different times. Brings us back to a story that John tells in his gospel, where in the nighttime, this Pharisee, Nicodemus, comes to Jesus, and he wants to try to understand who he is and what he's really teaching. He's been drawn. And when he comes to Jesus, Jesus tells him, you must be born again. And some of you know, you've heard that John, uh, Nicodemus' response is, how can I go back into the womb of my mother? How can I go back into the womb of my mother? He's thinking in the natural, where Jesus is talking to him about a spiritual birth, right? A supernatural occurrence through faith in him. And so here, when John is writing to the churches, writing to us about being born of him, it's about this new spiritual birth, a new life with a new identity, this new identity in Christ. And our main idea for today is this, agree with God about who he says you are. Agree with God about who he says you are. Because there are a lot of things that we try to fulfill ourselves with, different identities. There's lots of things that people and the enemy will want to say about who we are. But everything changes when we agree with God about who he says we are. And John gets right to it in the next verse. 1 John 3, verse 1, he says, See how great a love the Father has lavished on us that we would be called children of God. And that is what we are. That is who we are, friends. You have been declared children of God, not because of anything that you've done to deserve it or to earn it, but because he bestowed it on us. He lavishes this love on us, and he calls us children of God. And John is affirming, this is who you are. You have been declared children of God by your faith in Jesus. This is who you are. So being these children of God changes our identity, and that's what John is going to write about. He lavishes this love on us, and declares, you are my sons, you are my daughters. And this brings me back to a story that we see in the Gospels. So in the Gospel of Luke, this is the first grown-up story about Jesus. This is the first thing that we hear about Jesus once he's an adult. In Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist is out there being faithful in his ministry that God's given him, preaching about repentance and baptizing people. And Jesus, in John 3.21, goes to John 
we read this, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love and with you I am well pleased. You are my son and I love you. I am pleased in you. These words from the Lord, you know, this is before Jesus has preached to hundreds or thousands. This is before Jesus turned water into wine, before he made a blind man hear or a deaf a blind man see, a deaf man hear, before he cast out demons, before he raised people from the dead, before he did any of this ministry that we read about. God looks at Jesus and glorifies him, saying, you are my beloved son, and in you I am well pleased. Before he's performed some sort of incredible ministry. Why? Because this identity, this new um, witness for the people of the world to hear and to see, is that it's about the relationship. He is loved because of the relationship. This is exactly the same reason why you and I are loved and called children of God. It's about the relationship, nothing that you have done or deserved or earned. It's lavished as a gift of grace that you are loved by God. Romans talks about this adoption to sonship, this adoption as sons and daughters of God. In chapter 8, we read, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. It's this word, maybe someone has told you this before, that is a more relational and intimate title for father. We sometimes translate this daddy. There is a relational intimacy and love between the father and his sons and daughters, and he's chosen us for this adoption. Will you agree with God about who he says you are? Sons and daughters of his. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Just as the Holy Spirit testified on Jesus, came down like a dove and said, you are my son and I love you. The Spirit is given to us to say to each one of us, you are my son, you are my daughter, and I love you. I am well pleased in you. This is what Paul writes about in Romans. And because of that, we have a different reality. Testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him, there is this future that's guaranteed because we have a good father. And do you know our good father is sovereign? He's in control of the future. And so we become co-heirs with Christ. This is our identity as adopted sons and daughters. We get to share in the same glory that was shining on Jesus at that moment of his baptism. We get to share in that glory, co-heirs with Christ, because we are sons and daughters. And so John is going to talk to us about what it means, how our lives change if we actually agree with who God says that we are. He goes on in verse 2, beloved, beloved. Now we are children of God. He repeats it again. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. There's going to be a resemblance. There's a family resemblance. Here, we will be made like Jesus. And we may not be able to see it all now, but this is our future. This is the future picture that John is painting for us. And when he calls us, calls the people in the churches, calls the children of God beloved, there's something so cool about this reality because Jesus is also called the beloved one. 
So Jesus, like in Ephesians 1, when it talks about how God, by his grace, adopted us, says in Ephesians 1, verse 5, he destined us for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ in accord with the favor, the grace of his will for us, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely granted us in the beloved one. And the word there is agapeo. There are all these words for love. We often talk about how this selfless, sacrificial love of God is the agape love. And Jesus here is known as agapeo, the beloved one. And in him, born again as children of God, we are now beloved. The word is agapetos. We're the little beloved ones. In some of your translations, it says, dear little children. He has chosen you, adopted you, given you his spirit, and he calls you beloved. All of this love that existed, Father, Son, and Spirit, is now shared and offered to you, child of God. You are beloved. We are beloved. It's very similar to the way last week we saw that if we really know who Jesus is, this man who was born and grew up in Nazareth, if we really know Jesus, we know that he is Messiah, right? He is the Christ, the anointed one. He's the anointed one, and we are anointed by the Spirit of God. And in the same way, the beloved one has won for us this identity of the beloved, We get to be the beloved, and living this way changes things. That's what John wants us to know. He goes on in verse 4, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. So this is one of those pieces of teaching that John is trying to communicate to them about who Jesus is, right? Jesus is pure. Jesus is sinless, right? He was the spotless lamb of God that atoned for us and all of us. But according to false teaching, if you think that only the spirit or the soul can be good, and the rest of a person, like our mind, our thoughts, our flesh, if that's evil, then you would think that Jesus hasn't saved that part. And it's okay to do whatever you want with that part, your flesh, your thoughts. And John is saying, oh no, that is lawlessness, and Jesus died to take away our sin, to release us from our bondage to sin. And so instead, we get to live in Christ's righteousness, not in slavery to sin, right? So there's this idea, if we really know who Jesus is, if we really know that Jesus became fully human to save us fully and wholly in all parts of our being, then we know that we are being redeemed, every part of us, and we can live in his righteousness. So, Living as the beloved gives us a new picture of ourselves. Living as the beloved gives us a new picture of ourselves. Not just what we will be in the future, but how we get to live today. Set free from the bondage of sin, and instead, as people who have received the life of Christ and the Spirit of God, to guide us and empower us to actually live these new lives. We can't do it on our own. So he goes on and he says in verse 7, Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Don't let anyone tell you that a life of sin doesn't matter once you've accepted Christ. It does matter because it pulls us away from the reality of who God says we are. His children, sons and daughters, who now get to live in and walk in and experience the righteousness that Jesus died for us to have. Amen? We are different, beloved. We are different. He goes on in verse 8, The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. 
Last week, we saw John talking about this idea that worldliness leads us to go after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, all these things that we feel like we need to get for ourselves. But, beloved, when we know that we have this abundant, lavish love, grace, and mercy of God, we don't have to keep going after all those things. Instead, we have all that we need that satisfies our soul truly and allows us to live in freedom. So this has changed completely our reality if we agree with who we are because the works of the devil have been destroyed. We are called overcomers. And he goes on in verse 9, No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. So this idea that his life is in us, his salvation has taken root in us, right? We're justified, but we're also growing in our salvation at all times. His seed abides in us, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So in the last passage that we looked at, we saw over and over again this phrase, you know him, about knowing Jesus, knowing the true Jesus. In this passage, what John's going to do over and over again is this phrase, this is how we know. This is how we know who we are. This is how we know who the children of God are. And here he's saying it's the people who live according to their identity as the beloved of God, made new with the power of the Spirit to live righteously. And we can look at these verses, and does anybody get a little nervous when you read these verses? It sounds very black and white, doesn't it? One of the things that you need to pay attention to are these phrases like continues to, practices, right? There's this ongoing habitual lifestyle of saying that sin is okay, that we don't see a violation of being in relationship with God when we sin. That's what he's calling out here. This is also, beloved, one of the reasons why we have spiritual disciplines and we practice them in community with one another. It's one of the ways that we practice our righteousness as children of God. So he's saying here, we can know, we can know, we can have assurance because we now want to live our lives for God. There is a change that happens to us. When we have this new birth, part of our new identity, God has said, I'm giving you a new heart and a new spirit within you. Because with that old heart, we were hard to obedience. Like we didn't think that it mattered if we obeyed God. But with this new heart, as beloved children of his, we want to please the Father. We are inclined to love him. That's what he's talking about to us here. So living as the beloved develops the desire to love and please the Lord. If we agree with who we are and we live as beloved children, the agapetos, then we are going to develop this desire. We're not going to look at God's law and say, it doesn't matter. We're not going to look at God's law and say, I can do whatever I want and still go to heaven. Instead, we understand that life in Christ starts the moment that you put your faith in him and that this life for a beloved child is different. He goes on, 1 John 3, verse 11, For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Friends, if you agree with who you are, this reality that God's love is lavishly given to you, he has declared you his children, then you don't act out of jealousy or scarcity. Instead, you recognize that the love of God is abundant for you. This murder, it came out of jealousy, right? It came out of jealousy. So when we know ourselves as the beloved, we no longer have to act out of grabbing for ourselves fear or jealousy. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. 
We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. There it is again, that phrase. This is how we know who we are as the beloved of God, because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. The life of Christ and the love of God make us different, make us able to love God, love ourselves, and then love our neighbors. And so this idea that murder is the commandment, most of us know this from the law, but don't you think, beloved, that murder is a pretty low bar? I mean, most people can get through their lives without murdering anyone. And so here we see John connect hatred. And if we go to the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, where he keeps over and over again saying, you have heard, but now I tell you. Like, this is what you knew about the law, but now I tell you what real righteousness in me looks like. He says in Matthew chapter 5, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. What Jesus is saying is that this identity of beloved means that we are filled with the love of God in a way that we will begin to love other people, even those that we have previously considered unlovable. That the real child of God, the person who knows that this is the core of their identity, will not be the person who continues to habitually call people fools and idiots and mock them and be contemptful with people. And it doesn't matter if they think differently, if they live differently, if they vote differently, if they're poor drivers, none of it matters. Because we know ourselves as the beloved, and from that place, we overflow with the love of God for other people. This is what should change. Living as the beloved, agreeing with who God says we are, leads us into self-giving love. He introduced this idea of murder with the story of Cain and Abel. This idea of taking a life. But where he's headed is showing us that those who understand who they are as the beloved, we don't go take lives, we lay down our lives for others. Jesus humbled himself, came and was willing to be obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This kind of love, this kind of agape, lived out in the agapetos, in us, in you, son or daughter of God. It doesn't look like taking. It looks like laying down your life. This is what John is telling us. Things change when we know who we are and we agree with God. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but in actions and in truth. I can tell you this verse was memorized in my home with children. Because it's easy in a family to say, I love you, but not live out actions that would demonstrate it. This will result not just in a desire to love and please the Lord, but in actually living out that kind of self-giving love. That's what John is talking about here. Living as the beloved changes us so that things are not just theoretical or abstract. This is why I say all the time, don't keep encountering the word of God and then not taking a step of actual response. Like actually move towards someone in love. Actually lay down your life for the sake of someone else. Actually do it. Don't just talk about it. Don't just theoretically agree with it. Because when we know ourselves, As beloved children, we know that we have this abundant, generous love of God that fills us no matter what we pour out. 
that overflows from us so that we can express that to other people. This is what changes when we agree with who God says we are. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. This is that assurance he wants to keep giving. You are children of God when you know yourself as beloved and love other people. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, or the word is beloved, If our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. As beloved children, the desire to please him, it's no longer about fear, right? That all-consuming fire that is the Lord because now we get to stand in his presence in Christ, unafraid, unashamed, with confidence, But as we begin to be formed in this identity, we begin to pray prayers that are in line with loving God, loving ourselves as God loves us, and loving our neighbors. Our prayers become even more powerful and effective when we agree with God about who he says we are, the beloved. Little children, he calls us, because we are the beloved sons and daughters. This is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know. I think this is the fourth time he's used that phrase. This is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gave us. Church, his spirit testifies with your spirit that you are children of God, that you are beloved. He looks at you and says, this is my son, this is my daughter, and in you I am well pleased. Not because of something you've done, not because of something you deserve, but because of the relationship. Just like a parent with an infant child who literally cannot do anything for their parent, completely helpless. And yet still the parent has this incredible love for the child. This is how God sees you and how God sees me. We are beloved by God. That love becomes ours. It becomes our core identity Can you hear him speaking beloved over you this morning, church? As we spend time in response this morning, I'm just going to encourage you to replace your name in that scene. This is my beloved daughter, Kay. And in her, I'm in, and in her, I am well pleased. This is my beloved son, Joe. And in him, I am well pleased. Can you hear God speaking, beloved, over you this morning? Because when you live from that place, everything is changed. And I know I have a lot of other identities, right? I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a pastor. And for certain, the identity of pastor is one that can get very confusing, right? Because it's all spiritual. And I will do all that I can to consistently partner with the Spirit of God and the Word of God to be the most faithful pastor that I can be. But the reality is, no matter what I do or how I do it, that's not why God loves me. That is not my primary identity. All the things that you think about, that you do to be loved, Those are not your primary identity if you put your faith in Christ. Your primary identity is beloved son or daughter. Do you hear him saying that over you this morning? This is the spirit testifying with your spirit. Henry Nouwen wrote a book, Life of the Beloved. I recommend it. And I identify with his statement. He said, I kept running around it in large or small circles, always looking for someone or something able to convince me of my belovedness. 
He goes on and he says, self-rejection is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life because it contradicts the sacred voice that calls us the beloved. Being the beloved expresses the core truth of our existence. Do you hear him speaking beloved over you this morning? Beloved, are you going to argue with God about who he says you are? And I've had conversations with people, especially men. Men, do you feel too macho to be the beloved? Because that's what you were created to be. I know some people who feel too messed up still to really receive that as their identity, beloved. It's not based on what you've done, the good things, the bad things, the pedigree or the lack thereof. It's based on relationship that you receive through Jesus. I know some people that think like, well, if I just did better with these parts of my Christian life or I'm still kind of new at this, it is not based on your maturity in Christ. God has chosen you and adopted you and he calls you beloved friends. There's nothing that you have to do to earn it, but what you do need to do is agree with it and live from that new identity. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, this morning, we take time to, to sit and to listen to the voice of your Spirit speaking that identity over us, filling us with your love. Lord, would you help us understand that as the core, essential reality of who we are because of you. And Lord, today, for those who are crying out to know without a shadow of a doubt that they are loved, Lord, I pray today that they would put their faith in Jesus. It is through the sacrifice of Christ, this atonement we've been talking about, that we are forgiven, set free, filled with your spirit to experience life as the beloved. Lord, how do you want to lead us and guide us in that knowledge? We want to know to the depths and the heights, the fullest extent, your love for us, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and worship? And we have a couple songs this morning.